Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus, as you already know. Um, we have been covering for the last few weeks the U.S.-China rivalry. As I mentioned the last podcast with Ayaz Malik, that series is continuing. I am recording the conversations. But events in Pakistan mean that, you know, we had to shift gears a bit and look a bit inwards. Um, and if you've been a long-time listener of this podcast, um, then you know that I love going back to my favorite historian of choice in Pakistan, Dr. Ilhan Niaz, to frame these events in Pakistan within a historical context, because it's important for us to continue looking back at history to understand the present and then, you know, get a sense of the scenarios that may play out into the future. So we had Ayaz come talk about the structural views he has with regards to Marxist ideology or looking at things like Bonapartism and explaining that to us last week. This week, we have Dr. Niaz who's going to talk about how he sees events unfolding in today's Pakistan. We had him about over a year ago now uh, towards the vo- vote of no confidence that that ousted Imran Khan. And things have shifted a lot in that one year as well. So we'll talk about how Dr. Niaz looks back at his own analysis from a year um, to today. So Dr. Niaz, as always, a pleasure to have you on the podcast and thank you for taking out the time. Uh, thank you. Always happy to be here. So Dr. Niaz, maybe start off with, you know, helping us understand how you as a historian view events unfolding in Pakistan in the present. There is obviously this debate on social media that this is unprecedented. That position is then you know pushed back against by others who say well no not really look at what happened in the 70s under Zia or in the 60s under Ayub etc or what Musharraf did um help us understand you have studied Pakistan's history you have looked at the institutional evolution on the judiciary the military on the civilian side how should we be assessing today's events in terms of what's happened in the past in the country I think what we are now seeing is uh, that Pakistan is entering a post-constitutional phase in its history uh, and that the expectation post-Musharraf that we would be able to stabilize in some kind of a constitutional democracy, uh, albeit with some expanded role for the armed forces, but with civilian actors gradually getting stronger, Uh, that uh, expectation and that trend line has come to an end. And uh, why it has come to an end and how it has come to an end is something which I think uh, historians and other analysts will continue to debate. Uh, But I think uh, fundamentally uh, what has happened in Pakistan is that the political class as it stands today is so hollowed out in terms of credibility, and this incidentally includes uh, the PTI and Imran Khan, that uh, people are simply not willing to come out the way that they did against Ayub Khan, the way that they did against Bhutto during the PNA agitation, uh, the way that they did against General Zia, first in the students' uh, protest in 1981 and then in the MRD in 1983. Uh, or even the way that they did under uh, Musharraf. So when you look at, you know, these earlier agitations, what you see is that there are, for instance, in the Ayub Khan case, uh, more than 200 protesters shot dead. Entire cities are shut down for weeks at a time by the protesters. You have maybe as many as 8 to 10 million people taking to the streets in different parts of Pakistan, both East and West Pakistan. Uh, In the context of the PNA agitation, uh, something like 50,000 people were arrested by the Bhutto government in its waning days. And then, of course, when the army took over in July 1977, they also arrested all the People's Party people. So you can easily maybe double that figure in terms of the number of people who then got uh, incarcerated. Uh, Even under General Musharraf, uh, when he declared his uh, emergency, Uh, I think the official figure was something like 5,400 people were arrested. Uh, Human rights organizations claimed it was maybe twice that amount. 
so and if i may it. if i may interrupt you because the 100000 figure you gave from the bhutto era i think is important because if we adjust it for population today's terms it would be closer to a quarter of a million people 200 250000 plus people because at that time pakistan was roughly 80 million people today it's close to 240 million people so i exactly. wanted to contextualize uh, that number as well yes so uh, proportionately the uh, the comparison is a general downward trajectory in terms of popular mobilization uh, against uh, military or hybrid regimes and uh, this is something that we see playing out today so when uh, imran khan was arrested oblique seized from the premises of the high court uh, maybe he expected that there would be a tremendous outpouring onto the streets that, you know, people would come out in the hundreds of thousands in major cities and shut them down. And, uh, you know, Pakistan would have its uh, Erdogan moment of uh, a few years ago in Turkey. Uh, but uh, what instead happened was that, yes, there were protests and some of those protests turned very violent. But the kind of uh, mass peaceful uprising that is actually necessary in order to uh, push back against any kind of entrenched authoritarianism uh, simply did not uh, materialize. So at the end of the day, uh, I think that has greatly emboldened uh, the military as well, that they essentially feel that there is no meaningful political opposition, nothing that they can't handle essentially. And uh, that in turn is now leading to a situation uh, where essentially all the bets are off, that uh, we are in a situation where maybe there won't even be any elections come September or October or whatever. And uh, with the principle of uh, extended caretaker setups that uh, exceed the 90 day requirement of the constitution, in place in the Punjab and KP, uh, it is a relatively simple matter to extend that principle to the center and establish a you know, caretaker, technocratic government, a you know, cabinet of talents, Ayub Khan and Ghulam Muhammad style, if you will, and then run the country for two, three years until again, perhaps some opposition or other such thing starts to uh, match up. So uh, what we are looking at is uh, essentially a complete implosion of uh, all of our uh, civilian pretenses that Pakistan was headed towards any kind of institutional rebalancing and a great reassertion of uh, the strength of uh, Pakistan's military as a political and administrative actor. So I want to start with, you know, follow up on this with the military itself, because that's where you ended. But I would love your later on in the podcast thoughts on the hollowing out of the political classes you refer to it, like your thoughts on why that's the case, because we talked about the last time we had you on, you'd had mentioned uh, about the political awakening. I had a question for you on the PTI side, and you sort of believed that it wasn't the right type of political awakening. We'll get to that in a moment. Ayaz was on last week, and one of the things Ayaz argued in terms of the military's coercive power, and he agreed with what you're saying as well, that the military is sort of going to continue to gain dominance. But he pointed out this historical difference this time around in the sense that in the past, when the military asserted itself in Pakistan, um, a significant chunk of its core constituency, particularly in the Punjab, was in support of it. And his view was that that's really not the case this time around, which is why his argument was that we may see a scenario in which the repression may be even far more significant than what we've seen in the past, simply because there is no underlying popular support base for what the armed forces are doing or the military is doing at this point in time. How do you see that playing out in particular at this moment, given that we've had a lot of conversation in the public domain, social media, on the streets about the military's role and influence and the fact that its popularity has become far more, uh, has, has been eroded far more than what it has been in the past, for example, from the 70s era or the Ayub era or even the Musharraf era in that sense. Does that shift the dynamics of how this wave might play out in this instance? 
Well, I think one of the things is that we have to consider <clears throat> popularity in relative terms. So, uh, yes, of course, uh, you can make the case that an element of the Pakistani military middle class and bourgeoisie was very enamored of Imran Khan and probably still is quite enamored of him. And uh, those uh, individuals and those people had created an atmosphere and an expectation that uh, Imran would be able to pull off what up till this point in time, even far more popular political leaders have not been able to, which is to put uh, the uh, military genie back in the bottle. But uh, that uh, popularity or that uh, sense of support that Imran might have had in the uh, military or in the broader military class is possibly something that then emboldened him to take ex extra risks and those risks ultimately backfired after the 9th of May. So I'm not entirely sure that, you know, how much of this uh, popularity uh, within the uh, military class actually has a role to play in terms of the uh, success or failure of Imran. As far as uh, the Punjab is concerned, we often forget that uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was extraordinarily popular in the Punjab at the time that he was overthrown. And in order to dismantle the People's Party and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's personal popularity, the military had to resort to extreme repression, violent repression on a large scale. And it also uh, had to then launch various conservative, right-wing, centrist politicians, including the leaders of the PMLN, into politics. When they succeeded in dismantling to a degree the People's Party's uh, popularity in the Punjab, then they themselves became a nuisance for the military. And the PTI was sort of launched or encouraged or nurtured in order to dismantle the and popularity in the Punjab. And now what we are seeing is that the PTI is being dismantled and the various components of the PTI that were essentially ripped apart from other parties uh, are uh, being sent back to those old parties that were earlier dismantled. Uh, so it seems as if that, you know, at least at, at one level, we are great believers in recycling. And uh, none of this appears to have uh, been affected by the underlying popularity of any of these parties in the uh, Punjab. So uh, I'm not entirely sure that uh, this popularity argument in the Punjab would necessarily play out uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, I think that ultimately uh, the discipline of the military will prevail. And I think that uh, the PTI perhaps was misguided in thinking that they would actually succeed in fomenting serious discord within the ranks of the serving military and undermine the unity of command to a point where they would be able to set terms for the resumption of a uh, civilian dispensation or democratic elections or whatever else. And in that in that same vein, do you see there being parallels in the sense that we've seen sort of the, you know, the PTI is a party of the right wing. The military is obviously on the right of center. Um, and now we're seeing sort of the right wing elements on the religious side, like the former ASWJ folks and others coming out and, you know, singing knots and things in, in honor of the army chief. Um, do you see that again, having historical parallels in terms of what we've seen? Uh, Musharraf did that with the MMA, you know, Zia and company did that to cut Bhutto, as you argued. Ayub even sort of used Islam as a means to bolster his popularity. So is the playbook also in 2023 the same in, in many ways that, hey, we need to outflank our, our, our guy on the right. And so now we need to go back to the old guard of the Islamic value based parties to sort of nerd to sort of like help us achieve that goal. 
Well, <clears throat> that might be true to an extent, but uh, when you look at the collaborators of the military in its latest venture, you have parties like the People's Party and the ANP. Uh, you even have the PTM in the form of uh, Mohsen Dawar and others who are uh, collaborators with the military in this present uh, scenario. So I think that, uh, yes, uh, the uh, military might have a preference for uh, those uh, collaborators that maybe broadly share its worldview, uh, but uh, it isn't going to make that a sticking point when it comes to cobbling together a coalition. So the Pakistani left, such as it is, uh, is ironically helping the military, it is the mainstream left, is helping the military in its uh, present situation. So it's not simply a question of the uh, people on the right coming to support the military. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, right? And and again, I think that's something that we forget is, as you aptly put it, that they, the left whatever, if you can even call it the left in Pakistan, is actively collaborating with this project. And perhaps at this point in time, not realizing that the space that they are conceding uh, may come back to haunt them as it has in the past um, in, in, in so many occasions. Um, looking at another institutional element, right, you've looked at the role of the judiciary in Pakistan, particularly since, since the end of the Musharraf era. And we felt that there was this this position and assertiveness to the Supreme Court um, that made the framework of understanding the political economy in the country a bit different uh, in the last few years. Um, but now we've seen sort of Justice Bandeal take hard positions, for example, on the 14th May election deadline that he had set. But now he's walked back from it. And of course, the summer recess is coming up as well. How do you see the evolution of the Supreme Court's position as an institution uh, in this current crisis. Um, and again, is that again part of that same framework in your mind that we had an era where some progress was made institutionally to balance the military's power and that space basically has been lost uh, in rapid fashion over the last 12 months or so? Well, I think that uh, the popularity of uh, chief justices like Chaudhary Iftikhar, their willingness to be very trigger happy with the use of Suomoto jurisdiction, that created a popular profile for the superior judiciary that it previously did not enjoy in our polity. And as long as you had essentially aggressive chief justices that were willing to use their position to take a lot of so mottos and take a lot of this interventionist role, uh, that popularity appeared to have been sustained. Uh, in the case of the present uh, chief justice of Pakistan, he seems to have been far more cautious in terms of taking such notices. Uh, and he seems to have been more uh, perhaps focused on the judicial aspect of his role, barring a few popular cases which inevitably came to him, such as the vote of no confidence matter or a few others. But uh, that uh, sort of aggression that we have seen from his predecessors has not been manifested during his tenure. And I think that has actually cost the judiciary that the popular standing of the judiciary, its ability to mobilize public opinion, which is what is really needed under these circumstances, because, you know, it is not the uh, letter of the Constitution. It is the willingness of people to come out and defend the Constitution that lends the Constitution strength. And we saw that happening under Iftikhar Chaudhary, but we have not seen that happening under the present Chief Justice. So I think uh, that is one important difference. The other, of course, important difference is that uh, the political class, the traditional 
hyper actors such as students, unions, professional bodies, especially lawyers and others that typically act as the vanguard of any protest movement, they have largely been missing in action. Uh, you simply have not seen that kind of uh, agitation or upsurge from civil society, from the lawyers, from students, from other such groups that have historically played a very, very important role in leading and sustaining agitations against uh, military or hybrid regimes. So that is also something which I find very uh, interesting in that uh, you don't find that level of charge amongst them anymore. They are internally divided, perhaps. Maybe, you know, everybody feels that uh, tweeting about something is enough for whatever karthas uh, they need. Uh, but that is simply not there. So the ability of the judiciary to marshal popular support, independent of political forces, that appears to be lacking now. So in a way, uh, though I mean I say this with a certain amount of regret, uh, that kind of you know glimmer of hope that we might have had that you know at least there is one civilian institution which with many internal and other functioning imperfections is still uh, capable of asserting itself and occasionally giving the powers that be a bloody nose that also now seems to have essentially retreated into its shell. So uh, explicit constitutional commands regarding elections are being flouted by the government and the government supporters. And rather than disqualifying the government, holding it in contempt or doing other such things, the judiciary also now seems to be marking time. And this is essentially a new doctrine of necessity that has emerged. So, I mean, if I was a senior judge, I would you know, probably think that, you know, I have another one, two, three, four years left of service. But right now, the senior judiciary of the Supreme Court is essentially uh, headed to a place in our history reserved for the likes of Justice Munir. No, that's a very strong statement. And, and if I may follow up on that one really quickly, um, you said the Chief Justice has been far more cautious, which is evident, particularly um, since that meeting he had apparently with senior military officers um, ahead of the May 14 deadline. And I think that marked a shift in his tone and the way he was approaching this. And then, of course, May 9th. But how significant do you think is his inability has been his inability to keep his own house united, right? We know, and it's obvious that there's an internal split, 8-7 by some counts, uh, between the camp led by Justice Bandeal and the camp led by Justice Isa. Do you think that his the Chief Justice's inability to keep his house united at such a delicate time in Pakistan's constitutional history again has created that space for him to or, uh, you know, backtrack because he doesn't have his own house behind him. I think we often uh, forget that in Pakistan, uh, very often, even a majority of judges on a bench have been willing to collaborate with the military or the civil service oligarchy at a particular point in time. And it has been a minority of judges like Cornelius, for example, who, you know, sort of stood their ground and, you know, said that, you know, let justice be done, even if the heavens fall. And history remembers those judges very well, and it remembers the others very poorly, if at all. So when you look at the uh, way in which our superior judiciary has traditionally behaved, even uh, Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary had a lot of enemies and opponents within the judiciary. Uh, we often forget that there was a whole sort of emergency era, temporary chief justice that was brought in and a whole bunch of justices were kicked out uh, when they refused to collaborate with the emergency rule. So, but there were lots of judges who were willing to collaborate as well. So I think that as far as the you know, bureaucratic politics of Pakistan's uh, superior judiciary is concerned, 
uh, they are not particularly edifying. Uh, we saw this happen also in the context of when the PMLN uh, stormed the Supreme Court in its agitation against then Chief Justice Sajjad Ali Shah. And they had perhaps earlier succeeded in essentially creating a rebellion within the judiciary on various grounds. So this sort of bureaucratic infighting uh, has continued and it continued even when the judiciary was, uh, you know, at a better point in its popularity graph, and it will likely continue into the future. What I, of course, find uh, strange is that regardless of what, uh, you know, judges may think about any particular chief justice and how he manages the running of the uh, judiciary, the fact is that under the present circumstance, this division has essentially eroded everybody's power, everybody's standing. So even if there is one chief justice who is not very popular and there are other justices who are maybe uh, eager to exploit that to their advantage, the question is that what exactly do they stand to inherit if they collectively revert to the position that existed in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to 2005. So I think uh, that uh, failure uh, is something which is shared uh, across the senior judiciary, that at a very critical time, uh, regardless of whatever other agreements or disagreements they might have had, they needed to show unity in order to preserve the standing of their institution in the power pyramid of Pakistan. And having failed to do so, they, like the PDM, like the PTI, are now headed towards inconsequence. I think that's the biggest tragedy, right? I think you would agree is that whether it's the judiciary or parliament, which reflects political parties in Pakistan, they've been unable to unite at moments like these across our history, whereas the military as an institution does always come together when faced with an outside threat. And we've seen this, for example, if you want to, for the audience, visualize what, what I mean by that, just look at the Martyrs Day ceremony where General Bajwa was on the right-hand side of General Munir. And that symbolism matters. It's a reflection of the fact that Post May 9th, the institution stands united no matter what its earlier divides may have been. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but to me, that always is a big tragedy in Pakistan that the civilians in many ways do not uh, show a vision to unite at a time like this and set aside their disagreements to guard their own space and power in, in the institutional framework. Well, that is uh, unfortunate. And uh, we should, however, perhaps not expect military discipline from political parties and political uh, leaders. Uh, I mean, that's uh, not how uh, you would perhaps even expect them to function. And uh, political parties, by their very nature, are competitive with each other. They have, you know, internal factions. Uh, they are on the lookout for whatever benefit they might get for themselves or their members or their constituents. So in uh, that respect, uh, they are uh, not uh, under any kind of military discipline. But you would, however, think that leaders like Nawaz Sharif, like Shabazz, like Asif Ali Zardari, who have in their own lifetimes experienced repeatedly the cost of doing business with uh, the establishment in Pakistan, they would have a little bit more sense. And we also often forget that when uh, the Imran Khan government was dismissed, the PTI's popularity graph was on a steep downward trend. So if the PTI had continued in office for another six, seven, eight, nine, ten months or whatever, uh, you can well imagine a situation where this kind of economic crisis that we are facing would have unfolded on their watch. 
And they also don't appear to have had any ideas about how to deal with the real problems that Pakistan faces. So in that, perhaps, our political leaders are truly united. But uh, otherwise, uh, they uh, were on a downward trajectory. And the PDM, uh, by ousting them through a vote of no confidence, essentially helped uh, the PTI recapitalize its electoral fortunes. And that is something which created the problem that we are faced with, that the PDM feels that, well, you know, whenever elections are held, uh, they're going to lose. So that means that they don't want elections, whether in the provinces or at the center or anywhere else where they have any uh, reasonable expectation that uh, they are going to lose. So in that respect, uh, you can well imagine a situation where even the PDM leaders would be like, all right, uh, let uh, the technocratic government extended caretaker setup take over. And after a couple of years, when they are finished making tough decisions about the economy and maybe dismantling what is left of the PTI, then come 2027 or 2026 or something like that, we can then uh, reassert ourselves and return uh, to office. So, you know, the next generation of uh, our uh, family members can then have a chance to occupy the crease. And there's already talk of that, right? The financial emergency idea and theory has been bandied about uh, for, a, for a number of weeks now across uh, in, in many circles in Pakistan and outside. Um, Related to that, you said at the beginning of, of the podcast that, you know, the the political class has been hollowed out. And, and I would love to, like, you know, hear a bit more as to why you think that's the case. And I'll start ask this question in terms of pushing back. If I am framing myself as an insafian at this point in time, I would say, Dr. Niaz, I think you're wrong in the sense that look at the movement Imran Khan has led since his ouster. People have come out to his jalsas. People have come out in support of him and way more people compared to when Nawaz Sharif started his vote ko is do ka nara um, are now talking about the military's influence and role in the political economy. And, and Khan Saab is leading at, you know, at the vanguard of that chart saying this needs to end and young people in particular are standing by him. How would you then sort of respond to that, to your point about the military being uh, the political class becoming hollowed out. Would, how would you, you know, argue against that position that the PTI supporter might have? Well, uh, I would uh, contend that while the PTI certainly commands more popularity than the PDM parties, even perhaps put together. It has not been able to actually bring people out on the streets the way that we saw happening in the 60s or 70s or even 1980s. And while uh, young people or students or others may indeed be far more sympathetic to Imran Khan as a leader or whatever, uh, that has not actually translated into any kind of on-ground support for the party when it has faced the kind of pressure that it has come under. So I think that is something that we need to think about in terms of maybe party organization, maybe in terms of the uh, absence of uh, student organizations or groups that could actually manage young people in any way to bring them out for any agitation or whatever. But I think that also points to the fact that a lot of people who were thinking about voting for Imran were not thinking about voting for him because they necessarily agree with him, but because they were simply fed up of the way things were. And having experienced his government for three years or so, uh, very few of those people would be under any real illusions about what he can actually do should he return to office. 
So the manner of his ouster and the acuteness of the economic situation that followed, which people naturally blame the PDM for, should have actually created conditions in which, with you know, 40% inflation, you should be able to essentially shut down any major city of Pakistan for an extended period of time, if you call a strike, if you call a band or whatever. But that just has not happened. And one of the reasons perhaps why is because the PTI has focused so much on Imran himself that it has not actually engaged with people. It has not actually tried to build a strong local party organization. Uh, it has not actually set up a network of grassroots mobilizers. And it simply does not have that apparatus in place that can swing into action in the event that the leadership or the top even two tiers of the leadership are uh, picked up or detained or otherwise incapacitated. So there seems to be a gap between the sentiments that people have and the PTI's ability to channel those sentiments into meaningful organization, meaningful numbers on the street. So, I mean, if you just think about it, when uh, Imran was seized on the 9th, if even 500,000 people had come out onto the streets in Islamabad, Rawalpindi, Lahore, and Karachi, and just stayed there for a day or two, I think that would have been more than enough to send the PDM and maybe even its backers thinking of a serious compromise. If I may interrupt, that but, perhaps may have forced or created the space for the Supreme Court on May 15th to send the government packing in contempt for exactly, not holding elections. That, that Exactly. That might have also then given the Chief Justice the moral uh, standing that, you know, this is like a genuinely outrageous thing and people are genuinely outraged and there are hundreds of thousands on the streets, major cities have been shut down for three, four days. What is the government doing? And why is this uh, situation being allowed to persist? So I think that is a very large failure for the PTI. But that is also a failure that we've seen other parties struggle with. So when you look at the PMLN, notwithstanding their popularity in the Punjab, they were never able to bring people out onto the streets. When I remember when started. Nawaz came back, um, Shabazz Sharif was unable to even go to the airport with a throng of people to greet yes, his own brother. Uh, they had assembled a sort of caravan that was going to move from the old city to the airport. And uh, that wasn't very impressive, all things considered. And ultimately, you're right, I don't think it managed to reach the airport at all. So that basically shows you that there is a sense that <clears throat> the leaders, the political class, is morally bankrupt that even if people might like a political leader, no one really has that trust level or that confidence level that this leader is actually worth going out onto the streets for. So it doesn't really matter then how popular or unpopular any specific action that is taken against that leader might be. The agitation can then be contained. So this is a very interesting sort of uh, situation and this is perhaps something where you actually need a lot more research uh, because as i mentioned earlier the objective circumstances in terms of the economic situation that pakistan is facing is uh, far worse than what pakistan was facing during the anti ayub agitation it is far worse than what happened during the waning days of the Bhutto government it is uh, far worse than what was experienced during the first four years of the Zia regime before the US eight dollars started to arrive. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting uh, problem in a way for researchers to study. And I suspect, you know, maybe five, 10 years from now, there'd be a good doctoral dissertation in this. 
Well, that's a great idea for somebody looking to do that kind of research, right? Because it's it's one of those things that even in the grand scheme of things that we've seen in a technology enabled world happen the world over, um, it doesn't add up. We had the Arab Spring in in the Middle East, for example, in Egypt, people came out against Hosni Mubarak because the price of bread went through the roof. We've seen some similar events in Chile and Ecuador and Peru and other parts of the world where you look at mobilization of people against the status quo um, because the economic situation gets gets super super terrible in the modern age with social media and all of that. So why is not translating in the way uh, it should uh, or it has around the world in Pakistan is, is a question that I agree with you needs needs research. Um, the last question I have for you, if you were to sort of look at the past to offer us a lens into the future, perhaps some scenarios. And if I may, maybe if you even have a best case scenario, maybe share that with us. Um, but what are what are the best or good or worst case scenarios that are in your mind looking at what has happened in Pakistan in the past, how the Supreme Court has lost its space, how the political class is bankrupt, and how we're seeing a military that is not only assertive in the old ways of, of imposing itself, but is now armed with modern tools of surveillance um, that it did not have up until a few years ago. Um, where do you see or what things do you see happening in the near future in Pakistan? I think uh, if we draw a parallel with history, I think the situation resembles a lot in terms of what happened in, let's say, September and October 1958. Uh, Iskandar Mirza, uh, who was then our constitutional president, he realizes that he cannot realistically keep delaying national ele elections. He understands that whenever those elections are held, he is going to lose. And whatever else might happen, he'll be out of office. The Republican Party that he has cobbled together has, you know, something like 26 of its members in the cabinet. And at that time, that was considered a very large cabinet. Now, of course, it's a very small cabinet. Uh, and it is, however, politically quite useless. So, I mean, it's not going to be able to stand against any other political force. I it wonder has, who Abdul Qadir Patel of that cabinet was. Well, I, maybe many people would fit that role. But uh, the thing is that that uh, collaborationist uh, party has exhausted its political capital, such as it was. So you don't have a political party that can give you cover in the coming elections. You yourself are intensely unpopular, so you're going to lose those elections. So it is in that context that our constitutional president decides in October that he will abrogate the constitution, declare martial law, and essentially rule the country as a civilian dictator with the support of the armed forces that are at that time led by Ayub Khan. Now, Ayub Khan has over the last several years been receiving extensions to his tenure in the army as the army chief. And once the constitution and the whole thing is packed up, essentially, the president becomes redundant. And sure enough, three weeks after the first coup of October 1958, the military moves in and establishes a regime that then lasts for over a decade. So I think that we are now at that point, that the judiciary has been tamed, the uh, popular forces are divided and not strong enough, the ruling coalition has exhausted its political capital. And under those circumstances, essentially, uh, the current civilian dispensation, constitutional dispensation, has become redundant. 
because the civilian leaders themselves have over the last year or so effectively repudiated the very central parts of the constitution governing the holding and conduct of elections. So that I'm afraid is the situation that we are in. So how that plays out is open to question. Uh, whether that will be a kind of direct military rule or whether uh, there will be an extended caretaker setup or whether, you know, uh, the PTI will have been sufficiently bludgeoned by September to allow some kind of elections to take place and a King's Party type coalition to take over, you know, a calf league style during 2002. That remains to be seen. But, uh, you know, in a best case scenario, we are back to 2002. In a worst case scenario, we are back to July 77 or October 1958. Well, that's a very bleak outlook. And one follow up on that, because I fundamentally agree with, with that myself. The question I would love your thoughts on is that if we look at 58 or we look at 77, or we look at 2002, a key element through which those regimes derived legitimacy was the inflow of geopolitical rents. You and I have talked about this in previous podcasts as well. Um, this time around, there doesn't seem to be, at least in the near term, a tap that can be opened up to provide the geopolitical rents to alleviate the economic pain through which legitimacy can then be derived by expending patronage, etc., how significant is that shift? How do you see that that element of missing geopolitical rents at this point in time? Uh, I think that the <clears throat> geopolitical rents argument uh, is a little weak in terms of the chronology of how these regimes came into existence. So when we look at uh, Pakistan's first coup, the overthrow of Fajr Nazimuddin in April 1953, uh, this was before the Mutual Assistance Pact, and it wasn't really until 1955 that large-scale U.S. military and economic aid started to pour into Pakistan. But by that time, the hybrid regime was already two years old almost. When we look at the uh, Ziaku, then what we see is that for the first three and a half years of that period, from July 1977 all the way until January 1981, when Reagan takes over, there really isn't any geopolitical rent coming in. But the regime is able to not only crush the People's Party, it is able to essentially execute, assassinate the prime minister. It is able to disband the student organizations. Uh, and yes, after 1982, the American first package comes in and then 1987 second package comes in. So that does actually ease the situation. Uh, in a similar manner, when Musharraf takes over in October 1999, for the first two years, his regime is a pariah. It does not have any economic geopolitical rents coming in. Uh, but Musharraf himself is popular, his regime is stable. And even if those rents had not come in, I don't see a scenario where in, let's say, 2001 or 2002, the PMLN or the People's Party would have been able to cobble together a popular revolt and overthrow him. Uh, so in that respect, uh, in terms of military takeovers or authoritarian takeovers, uh, in three of the four major instances that we have had in Pakistan, the geopolitical rents materialized years after the takeover had already taken place. So those rents might have helped prolong those regimes, but they did not cause those regimes to come into power nor were they of any immediate benefit to that regime in the early and very difficult phase where it actually had to dismantle 
a reasonably popular and credible political opposition and consolidate power. I think that's a very important point. So thanks for explaining that, because one thing I personally have been thinking about is this attempt being made by the PTI through the American Pakistani diaspora, for example, in particular, but also in England and Australia and other places where there is a big chunk of their support base to you know, lobby for or advocate for stronger statements or engagement or diplomatic sort of actions uh, with regards to what's going on in Pakistan. And my view has been, well, one, there is not a whole lot of leverage at this point in time because the rents aren't there. Um, and two, if we look at other parts of the world, for example, Egypt, um, then we know that, you know, the West will poo-poo the, the actions for a little bit and turn its head around. Um, but that does not prevent a dictatorship from establishing itself in a country. Um, and I think folks need to realize that. So I, I thank you for, for sort of explaining the timeline of those events in the past. Last, last question, maybe to end on a lighter note. Um, would you put Shabazz Sharif in the top three worst prime ministers of Pakistan's history? That is a very tough competition. But I think with 40% inflation, uh, no prime minister has presided over that kind of inflation in Pakistan's history and had uh, essentially that bad of an economic manager in charge of everything after having kicked out a competent manager to begin with. So uh, I think that... Uh, Yes, I mean, Shabazz Sharif is not doing well. And although uh, our standards and our expectations are very, very low, uh, he has managed to find uh, new subterranean layers in which to sink his reputation. And since you said it's tough competition, who would be the other two in, 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 in his lane sort of? running right behind him or right ahead of him in terms of historical terms? Oh, well, I mean, I think his own elder brother would be a very close second. And the recently deposed Imran Khan would also be very close competition. So, I mean, uh, it's uh, basically, uh, you know, asking this question is a bit like uh, very, very difficult to answer in terms of, you know, how do you judge someone to be a good prime minister or a bad prime minister. Uh, but I think that we have had some serious people as prime ministers, including Yaqad Ali Khan. Uh, surprisingly, I would even rate Junejo uh, much higher than uh, many of the prime ministers that uh, we've had. Uh, and Suravardi would also perhaps rank pretty recently in our uh, pantheon. But uh, these are very slender pickings. Well, it's not that comforting that the last three big characters, so to speak, Nawaz, Shabazz and Imran Khan are in, in that top of the worst list in a way, especially because I was reading or referring back to Naseem Zara's wonderful Kargil to the coup. And it, it, there's a passage in there about how the establishment wanted Shabazz to be deputy PM in Islamabad and eventually run the show uh, back in, nine, in the in 1997-98 before the coup. And I was like, well, they've had, they, they, you know, they, they tend to get what they want eventually. And it doesn't turn out that well for them or for the country. So... That's uh, another another tragedy in that sense. But Dr. Niaz, as always, a pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you, to hear your insights. And again, I think it's important for us to continue looking at history because as, as you were saying, we're in this loop in Pakistan. Um, and, and I think uh, we need to get out of this, but at least for the foreseeable future, I at least don't see it, but I'll let you have the last word before we end this podcast. But I think that... Uh, we are not going to see too much uh, deviation from the pattern that has unfolded. And uh, I think it's just unfortunate that another generation of Pakistanis is going to have to try and construct a legitimate political order, which is something that has defied our collective ability to achieve 
in 75 years. With that, thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us for the office. Thank you. Thank you for the office.